good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see all of you here and um, to this very important panel discussion on breaking the silence and men's mental health issues. And before we start, let me give the floor uh, to our director, Maria Grachov. You're welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, very, very welcome again to the Nordic Council of, of Ministers and uh, our fantastic space here at the Arvamus um, Festival. It's a bit hot here for the panel, uh, I think, uh, for all of us. Um, I will not introduce this panel any further because I will let my colleague uh, Yevgeny do that. But I do want to apologize. We don't usually have all male or all female panels. Uh, and we didn't initially. This was initially actually a mixed panel. Um, but one of the panelists fell sick. And we are actually very grateful that we can still run this panel. Because thanks to, to Martin and his organization, a replacement was found. Um, but it means an all male panel. But given the topic, hey, why not? Uh, and uh, now I hope everyone will enjoy it and prepare your questions and uh, bear with us in the heat. I struggle myself. I'm from the Arctic, so this is a little too warm. Um, but there's water available. And uh, now, please uh, go ahead and uh, enjoy. Yeah, thank you, Maria. So we were just discussing a minute ago that uh, usually men are talking to each other in saunas. So we are almost there. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Uh, we, we are very glad to see you here in Baida and also for those who are watching us online. And uh, we hope that we'll be discussing a very important topic and not only we here, but we'd like to interact with you, with the audience and with those who are online. So I also have a couple of questions uh, which I'd like to ask a bit later on slider.com. So be ready for that. And uh, not only men, of course, are invited to answer the questions, but uh, women as well. So yeah, my name is Evgeny and I'm the program coordinator from Nordic Council of Ministers office in Estonia. And um, I'll try to play a role of an ordinary man uh, who, of course, uh, struggled with different issues and uh, challenges around men's mental, physical, sexual health. But then I also try to find out different uh, possibilities uh, just to understand what's going on with me. And I'm very happy that we have a, a very great uh, guest here and um, a esteemed group of experts and specialists uh, who have dedicated their careers in supporting men's uh, mental health. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Ot Oya, who is the director of Estonian Mental Health and Wellbeing Coalition. Uh, we have here Jonas Kekkonen, the development and education manager at Miesakit Association from Helsinki, Finland. We have here Are Sasta, the general director of Reform. Uh, this is a resource center for men in Oslo, Norway. And we have Martin Ott, the head of psychosocial support team at MAN which is an organization in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, so, of course, despite the significant uh, strides in breaking the stigma around the mental health, there remains a crucial gap in understanding and addressing uh, the unique challenges fa faced by men. Because women are talking about mental health, I don't know, just during the coffee break or wi with their friends and so on. Um, I hope I'm right, um, I'm right, but maybe not. But as for men, it's not so easy for us as I'm playing the role of ordinary men. It wasn't and still is not so easy for me to talk about mental health issues. So uh, moderating this panel is kind of a challenge also for me as well. But uh, let me uh, tell you that our discussion goals and then we'll start. So first of all, we'd like to start and highlight the complex issues which are related mostly to mental, but also to physical and sexual uh, health. We'll try to discuss uh, cultural and uh, societal factors affecting man's willingness to seek help. So why, if we understand that we have some issues, why don't we ask for help? 
and also to uh, examine different barriers to accessing uh, health uh, services because I myself also was trying to uh, find a psychotherapist for at least one year or I had to wait in a line for so long time. And also we'd like to continue to interact with you, dear audience, here and online to ask you different questions and you are always welcome to um, to uh, ask questions. And we'd like to finish uh, this um, uh, panel with the kind of uh, good advices and might be also innovative approaches from Estonia, Finland, Sweden and Norway um, for supporting men's health. So let's start from the first question uh, to our panelists and um, it's kind of a very easy question but I would like to, uh, to get to know and I hope that you like to get to know your experience as an expert and specialist in this field. So what are these unique challenges that men face around this topic of mental health in each country? So we can start from Estonia. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, this seems to be a bit stuck. All right, here it goes. Okay. Uh, for men, mental health in Estonia, yes, obviously there's huge challenges. Uh, I mean, if we uh, look at uh, Actually, maybe the best uh, thing to look at in it is like the wider picture of men's health in general in Estonia. And here we, we look at the stats. Uh, we could say that Est uh, Estonian women, their uh, health profile is basically that Estonian women are from Scandinavia. And Estonian men, their health profile, the men are from Eastern Europe. So women live considerably longer, live healthier lives. Uh, and their profile sort of fits what we would expect maybe to see in a Scandinavian country for a woman. And the m for men, the profile really fits this sort of classic, a bit stereotypical Eastern European man sort of uh, way of life and health outcomes. So for in most areas of uh, or, uh, or health, men are worse off than women, and it's a lot to do with our lifestyles. Uh, this uh, is really well uh, sort of uh, illustrated by alcohol consumption and alcohol deaths where uh, there are four times more alcohol deaths among men than there are among women in Estonia. And when we talk about sort of mental health issues, for instance depression, sort of the risk factors or sort of or, uh, the, the amount of people at risk of having, for instance, uh, a the depression, depression, so not diagnosed, but at risk based on sort of uh, screenings. Uh, men are very similar uh, to women. Of course, uh, as in most countries, uh, women score a bit higher in a negative sense, uh, but uh, men are not that far behind. But when we talk about actually getting treatment, getting to a diagnosis, men just throughout their life have are at a very low sort of... Uh, uh, more than uh, more than twice as, as few as uh, women. So there's a huge gap between, especially in the younger years and older years, of men that are at risk of having a mental health uh, disorder and actually seeking and getting help. And sort of what sort of might be pushing for this is uh, one really important factor, of course, in general, is Estonian men turn to. Uh, uh, help and turn to especially to treatment in their last resort. Uh, if uh, if you really, really, really can't handle it yourself anymore, well then I'll do something. Or uh, and then it's of course quite a bit too late. You have much more issues, or it's r you you can't really. Oh, it's it's not that, that easy to get that help anymore. And uh, may, may I ask you uh, right now about some statistics uh, that you told about depression, maybe it's also uh, anxiety and suicide. Yeah. Do, do you have some numbers around Estonia? So just jumping to suicide, uh, Estonia has uh, roughly 200 suicides every year. Uh, it's we've been sort of hanging around that number uh, for a really long time now. And 80% of those are men. So when we look at the, the suicide rate per 100,000 people, for men, it's 24 uh, every year for 100,000 uh, 100, people that take their own lives. In a, for women, that's five. Uh, as a comparison, uh, in the EU, uh, for men, 
it's uh, uh, 17, and for women, it's four. So Estonian women are quite close to the EU average, and uh, the Estonian men are just far, uh, far uh, further from the average and really one of the leading uh, countries in Europe uh, at the suicide rate. And among the, for uh, anxiety and depression, especially uh, in the younger years, so for young adults, uh, young men, the depression rates are nearing, uh, depression risk rates are nearing 50%, while those getting treatment are around five or even less. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Jonas, what about the Finland? Do, do Finnish men have the same challenges and facing the same challenges and issues around the mental health? Well, well, in Finland, <laughs> as I sit here between Estonians and Scandinavians, well, our statistics are between those two. And there are actually really bad stereotypes about Finnish people that we, we think that are still true. But for example, our suicide rate, we went from 40 per 100,000 to 20 in a few decades. And this drop has been something that we have been working on. My, my, my main point is that for this discussion as a whole will be that everything takes resources and time and professional work and peer group work. But for example, our alcohol consumption has been steadily going down. And it's not just that Estonian booze is pricier than before. <laughs> it's, it's also that Finnish people are <laughs> not seeking to get drunk all the time like they were a few decades ago. It's, uh, things are changing in Finland and men are part of that change. And I, I must say that all the good changes that we have are partially because men are participating themse themselves and problems are being normalized for men. In Finland, men, men usually act out when they are in a so sort of breaking point in their life. If they move to another county, when if they get divorced, if, if they have children and they are stressed out in their work and if they retire, there are these points where men act out and they can get depressed, they can have stupid accidents. Actually, accidents and different kinds of deaths that involve different kinds of substances are very, <laughs> our statistics for those are not good, especially when we talk about uh, drugs and young men. Most of the deaths there are young men who are not highly educated. And in Finland, most of the problems men have are also class problems. And also what you said about having, uh, having the help you need is a class thing in Finland. So that uh, almost all the therapy budgets are going into, about 85% of them are highly educated Finnish-born women who are taking those services and using them as they should be. Men in Finland are bad at recognizing their own problems, bad at knowing what, where, those th where, where there are services for those problems they are and uh, they are experiencing and then as a third part they are really bad patients because they they usually undermine their patience they they say that this isn't a big problem or if someone says that i don't think this is that big of a deal they take it to their heart even though it may be something that is devastating them and their lives so if we can go through all these three problems and carry them so that they are seeking help and getting that help and staying for that help. We are getting men to participate. And as I am from an association that is a known governmental organization, we are seeing that men talk about their problems really willingly if we give them a stage for that. But they feel that they don't have a part in our system. Participating in an all-male panel, I, I work with men all the time, but usually I'm the only male there when we are discussing these things. About 85 to 90% of Finnish socials, social and health field is women. And it's, it's not a bad thing, but it makes it harder for men to seek help and get help. Thank you, thank you, Jonas. Uh, what about these uh, issues in, in Norway? 
Well, uh, yes, this is on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jevgeny, it's uh, very interesting listening to uh, Oit and uh, and Jonas also because uh, you Oit is speaking as Estonian men are very unlikely, uh, not not the same as uh, a man in the in the Nordics, uh, uh, but that's not right because we have the same rate in Norway. I think you do also in Sweden. Uh, it's 73 uh, percent of uh, the suicides in Norway is uh, is men, and uh, it has been like that in for many years. So it's a it's a it's a way of seeking uh, or uh, meeting health problems, mental health problems. That actually is, I think, uh, connected to uh, masculinity in some way. And it's that is quite quite universal. You, you find it uh, everywhere in the world. There are some differences, though, and there are possibilities to to evolve and to get better. And um, you have to 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 seek to find uh, the the reasons why our men, as a group, uh, behave like this. Why do they take their lives? Why don't they go to the doctor? Um, I must point point out uh, that this is not uh, all men. Some men do uh, seek help, and some women don't. So we also tend to speak about men and women as very homogeneous groups. They are not. But as groups, uh, we talk about statistics, and then we have to point out what is uh, the main reason here. Um, I think that unique challenges for men facing mental health has to do with um, lack of self-understanding standing by men. This isn't something I should deal with. I'm strong. Uh, to say that I'm coping with mental health issues or even health issues as, su as such, uh, not to speak of sexual uh, health issues, uh, is unlikely for a man to do because we are w perceived to be strong. And uh, that's a main problem. And then on the other side, men are also met in society with uh, an ex expectation that we are strong and the lack of empathy for men is also quite immense in society. Men should endure. Men should take the blame. Men go to war. Women don't. Men, men can die and men can be prone to use violence and also be beaten. That's okay. Uh, so we look at men as something very strong uh, and a lot of us are not. And none of us are strong all life. I have a friend, he's sitting in a wheelchair. He's saying, you think you're not a patient, but you will be. Everyone will be a patient in some part of life when you're born and when you're going to die and maybe al also during life, you have to face, you are going to be weak. And to understand that, to say that men also can be weak and can understand that weakness is a way of, is, is a part of life, I think that is very crucial. Thank you, Ara. And let's go to Sweden and uh, which are these challenges which uh, Swedish men are facing? Um, okay, so first of all, uh, I, uh, I'm the team that I represent at uh, Men for Gender Equality uh, works with the, the target group 10 to 25 year olds. So that's my, uh, my scope uh, when I talk. And I, I talk, uh, I prefer to talk about those, those people. Um, uh, however, uh, statistically, 72% uh, um, uh, from the latest number uh, of uh, all committed uh, or followed through suicides are made by men. Um, however, um, suicides attempt uh, are uh, women are um, um, in greater quantity. Um, men report better uh, uh, mental health than women do. Um, 
straight men um, report even better health than women uh, do. Uh, so for me, the picture is, and I'm being a provocative uh, a bit, I understand that, but it's, a, it's not a complete picture. It's, it's a it's blurry picture of, of men versus uh, women's uh, and others' uh, mental, physical, and sexual health. Um, but there was a few things that, uh, when I listened to you guys, uh, that I really w uh, would uh, like to, like, for me, um, it's important to uh, uh, keep apart. Uh, so uh, w one thing is, is getting uh, and um, seeking and getting help, uh, which, is, um, which is where I leave a part of the responsibility to someone else to help me. You know, I, I can't reach for the top shelf, I need help. Uh, the other, the other uh, thing is support. I can't reach for the top shelf, uh, support me in finding a way to, to get there. Uh, and the help part um, isn't really where I like to focus my work. I, I like to focus what we do on the support uh, bit. Um, uh, so just, just to, to, to have that in the conversation and I also very much like when you all uh, talked about um, participation, uh, being able to be a part of the discussion about your own health. Uh, sitting around that table, being a part of the conversation is really important for boys and young men. Um, and we see that a lot in schools, uh, a lot in the um, healthcare system, that that is not really happening. Uh, they're not able to uh, attract boys and young men into that discussion, which is a huge problem, uh, because then it becomes a, like a blank spot. Um, uh, and uh, the last point uh, I would like to bring up is um, some of you, some one of you said, um, uh, men with um, a mental illness uh, often act out, and. Um, choosing violence uh, either against yourself or against others is a really common uh, way for a man to express um, depression so and what i want to say with that is men's uh, mental illness affects a lot of people around them um, on a structural level on an individual level it could look really different but on a structural level that's what's happening so we need to take that into account also that it becomes a, uh, a broader problem than, than the individual's uh, mental illness or mental health. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Now we have a little bit of this picture uh, from different countries. And now I would like also to interact a bit with the audience who is here uh, at this venue, in our tent, but also with those who are watching us uh, via Facebook. So I'd like to you to go to slider.com and as we as the Nordic Council of Ministers we we have to be equal with gender equality. So first I would like to ask only men, but then the same question which we're asking could also be answered by women. It would be also interesting to see the collaboration, uh, not collaboration but uh, correlation. <laughs> Uh, about the same question, but how men and women uh, can answer. So we can go to the slider.com and put the code 3584908. And first of all, I would like men to ask this question. And the question is, dear men, have you ever sought help for mental health issues? And the number? number is on the screen, it's 3584908. Zero eight. So first, uh, please, men, could you answer this question? And we'll see uh, the results as well. And also, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll. S we I'll. I'll ask uh, women to answer the same question. And I can tell you what are the uh, answers there. Uh, so, do you have you ever sought the help for mental health issues? Yes. No. I need this support right now. I can handle it myself. I don't need any help. I don't know who to turn to uh, for help. So there are different uh, possibilities to answer this question. 
So now we, we, we give approximately 30 seconds for men to, <laughs> to answer the question. And then I open the, the same pool for uh, women. And dear women, you will also have a chance to answer. And we'll see. And also we'll discuss. And while men are uh, answering, I would like to ask you, dear guests and dear experts, so we found it out some um, societal and maybe cultural forms and expectations. Um, I also had a list. I found it from the internet. There were more than 100 different points, a list of stereotypes about men. So some of them you already uh, pointed out. So um, men are often uh, perceived as being unemotional or less expressive about their feelings. Um, there is a common belief that men must be physically strong and resilient. I'm not going to read all the 100, so just some of them. Um, men are believed to be less interested in household and uh, child care. Um, there are stereotypes that men are more likely to take risk and engage in dangerous activities. So a long, long list of different, different uh, stereotypes which actually could be a partly a truth so that uh, my question is could we now discuss what are these um, uh, cultural for norms and uh, societal expectations uh, which affect men's mental health how do you think well, it could be like top three can i yeah yeah, uh, yeah so um we focus quite a bit on, on this topic uh, at um, my job, and um, I found uh, two, um, I think they're American uh, researchers called um, Matthew Oransky and mm -hmm, Fisher. Oransky and Fisher, uh, and they did a meta study on um, the, the norms affecting boys. And they came up with four like main categories, and, and they're constant effort. Uh, physically, sexually, sexually uh, mentally, uh, emotional restriction, uh, heterosexism, and um, social teasing. Um, so you can Google them I if you're uh, interested. But what I think, for me, I I'd, I'd put heterosexism on the top because it, it embodies everything that, that um, is existent in, in the others as well. So constant effort is is something that you know you can um, address to the to the uh, male other male attributes. So for me, that I, I'd set that on the top. That like the the sexual um, um, narrow room that the man can um, uh, man maneuver within is is for me the the, the top one. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I go along with that, but I also think that. Um, uh, the notion that men are unemotional or less expressive uh, to talk about mental health or their feelings. Um, as Jonas pointed out, if you give men opportunity to talk about feelings, I think they do. Uh, it's quite uh, challenging doing that. Um, we have some uh, organizations, organizational uh, collaboration with an organization in South Africa called Sonke Gender justice. Uh, they told me once that uh, they had um, a course for men that wanted to make dinner, make food. But they couldn't do that in South Africa because then they were t uh, seen as uh, too weak. Uh, men shouldn't make food, shouldn't be in the kitchen. So to, to teach those men uh, cooking, they had to do it b behind uh, drawn court curtains. So the, the women couldn't see them, because, and the women shouldn't see them, because the women were bullying them. Women were saying, you are not the men uh, we want. So cultural norms holding men down as not emotional, not uh, capable of being able to care, give care to children, I think that's a main stereotype of perceiving men as male individuals. Thank you, thank you. Okay, three points. The first one is that they have to show their worthiness and it 
has to be recreated again and again, and they don't think that they are worthy of the help that they should have. And this is, this is something that hinders helping them. This is partially about the strength. And the second point is that there are points in people's lives that they are weak. And there are things that you just can't push through, and men try to do that. For example, in Finland, we have highest rates of schizophrenia in the world. And that's something that you just can't push through, even if you try with all your might. You just have to have that help. And, well, the, the third part is maybe stereotypes that we live through. For example, in Finland, men are spending more time with children than women are when they, they are school age children. And this is something that is not accounted for in almost any discussions about parenthood. But men are taking them to their hobbies. Men are making food in Finland. They are still not vacuuming. That's <laughs> still not happening. But otherwise, they are taking different roles than they used to. But this is not something that, this is something that, for example, 20 year olds do, and this is something that 35 year olds do, but discussions are had by 50 or 70 year olds. And then we talk about things that are past. And this, this is something that hinders men from getting help. So we have to see that, we have to see that masculinities have been changing and how we, perform as fathers and men is different than it used to be for in the 1990s, for example. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't think I'm going to add much anything here because I think that what you guys covered was well, really brought it together. I really agree with uh, Martin that this, especially the heterosexuality or uh, sexualism, uh, that uh, to just uh, how it's being pushed into everything, how it actually translates into most of the expectations that are, there are towards men. Of course, also this uh, constant performance. I mean, uh, things we learn in a kindergarten, men don't cry. So you basically train it out of yourself. And then you get, that keeps building. But of course, again, generations are changing. And of course, in generation, there are generations that are also a lot of differences. So again, I think uh, another important part is not to overgeneralize, but also pay attention to the wider social trends and these narratives that we work in that really constantly shape us and uh, create these limits for us. Okay, so now we are here about uh, really different, uh, some kind of uh, cultural background, but Bo Baltics and Nordics are almost similar. So as for your example, Arya, so dear women, please don't bully us if we are cooking something. Uh, it's, it will be better to encourage us. And now women, um, I would like you to ask the same question. It's the same slider.com 3584908. And uh, the same question to you. Dear women, have you ever sought help for mental health issues? And while you are us, uh, us, uh, answering this question, so we are going further. Uh, what we now found it out that actually men are seeking help. Um, some of us, we already understand that if something is wrong, we, we can go and ask for help. And there are very good organizations represented in all the Nordics and Baltics as well. But still, uh, there might be some barriers uh, for accessing uh, mental health. Uh, so could you please share a little bit about your own experience? So how youngsters, how men are coming or calling or writing or how they're asking uh, for help and how this process is going? And is there a actually quite a long line as uh, I had my own experience here in Estonia? Who would like to start? Uh, I can o on that side. I can actually only share my personal sort of uh, experience, uh, as I'm not a mental health professional who's actually working directly with uh, patients or people. But uh, when I was earlier saying that men only seek help in the last resort, in my personal experience, at least, 
there's one other situation where we seek help when the women in our lives tell us to. Uh, so it's actually difficult for me to think of a time that I turned to a doctor uh, when it wasn't absolutely critical and I should have already gotten myself uh, 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 what was it? Kirabi. Ambulance. Ambulance, thank you. Uh, but otherwise it's always been some of one of the women in our, my life tell me, hey, hey the, the thing, you should, you should go check it out. I go to your doctor. All right. All right. And uh, for me personally, I have uh, an ADHD diagnosis, which I have thanks to that lovely lady standing there who is my colleague, and uh, when we started working together, she, she was like, you know, the, uh, you have so many of the symptoms. I was like, nah. And I, I t went through a quite a lot of effort to disprove her, and when I couldn't, then I uh, went and sought help, and it's really changed my life for uh, the better. So, uh, again, it's a lot about the people in our support structure. But it's very interesting. Now you pointed this, uh, actually, a very important question. Why didn't you notice yourself? How do you think that you, s you told actually we are very thankful to you women surrounding us, our partners and the sisters and mothers. But what's behind that? Um, I mean, ADHD is a bit difficult in that sense as well because it completely sh shifts the way you sort of interact and uh, like perceive the world. So uh, the way I always had seen the world was normal to me. I had no idea everyone But I else mean, in total, not about this yeah. uh, illness as well, but in total. In, on, on everything else, it was like, it will go over. It will blow over. Or if I had, uh, when I was younger, I had some, like, I mean, I would say negative experience when I visited a lot of doctors and we couldn't figure out what was wrong. Well, then I got tired of it. Like, they're just going to ship me to another doctor. Why, why bother? And so you get this avoidance behavior. But yeah, it, it's always uh, also this mindset that it will blow over. It, there, will, there will be, and then you just get used to it. Yeah, the truth is somewhere in the middle, I suppose, that uh, maybe we can just die if we don't ask for help, but maybe just we'll come up with that. Yeah, we yes, can die. Of course we can die. I mean, uh, if you don't go to the doctor when you are feeling ill, it may be a very serious cancer situation. And for men, prostate cancer, uh, men in my age and younger than that, should seek help to, sh to shake their prostate. How many, we, you could have asked that question also, Yevgeny. How many of you have actually asked your doctor to make a test about your prostate? In Norway, there are, you have, good, you have, good, I have. But most men don't. And if the healthcare system don't ask you to do it, you won't. And in Norway, 1,000 men per year dies of prostate cancer, and a lot more uh, live with it. And, uh, and it affects their, their peers, their families, their spouses, their sisters, their mothers, their brothers even. So it's very important for all of us that, uh, to actually seek help. But this is two ways, because it, it has to do with how we ourselves uh, think about our body, but it also has to do with a health care sy system that's actually designed to meet men. And very often the healthcare system in the Nordics and in Norway are not uh, uh, designed uh, to be understood as a healthcare system for men. And uh, not only because uh, most of the workers are female, uh, I'm very glad for everybody working in the uh, healthcare system, and if they are female, I appreciate as much as, uh, as uh, if they were men. But the healthcare system is designed to be understood as something, as a female area, a f female uh, arena, arena. And I think that is a societal and uh, structural problem we have to do something with. I think they have to do with uh, getting more men to work with health uh, and also to change the education for the healthcare system workers. Thanks. You said that men only seek help when women compel them to, but we've been working with men who perpetrate domestic violence, and we have been working with men who experience violence for decades. And one situation where they seek help is when they come to us and they say that she's been hitting me for years, but now she's doing it to the kids. 
and that can't go on. And still, he's not interested in himself, but the kids. So that's, that's an anomaly there, but men care, and they seek help when it's affecting others, what's happening. And we have been working on those hinge points in their lives where things can go awry. For example, when we, when we began to work with men who are going through divorce, we, ha we have a program, Erosta Elossa, Alive Through Divorce. And it's aptly named because in Finland men have stupid accidents and they drink themselves to stupor and they commit suicides and they murder their families, ex-spouses and kids when, when they are going through divorce. But after working with divorces for 10 years, we began to notice that it wasn't that hard for men to get that help. Because after that time, we had men who were saying to other men that, hey, I, I, I went through that same hell, and I got help, and this is normal. You go there, and you get a better divorce, and you get to meet your children more. Everything will be better, and this is just something that guys do. But we needed that 10 years for men to get into that mode, and for other men to begin saying that this is normal, this is something that you should do. It takes time, and it takes patience and work. But that's our experience. Thank you. Yeah, Martin. Um, OK, so a little bit more of the um, like a low threshold um, area or arena where I'm working. Uh, so um, st starting, starting with, uh, I, I wrote down branding, which is such a stupid word for it, but um, um, we started our uh, support chat uh, um, because the chat that uh, reached out to all kids only got like 15% boys. And we said that there must be something wrong with that. Uh, is, is there are so few um, boys needing support. Uh, so we branded it like guys. And so they came. Um, so um, another word, of another way of saying that is if you show them that this is a space for you, yeah. they will come. Um, and we will listen to you, and we will not judge you, they will come. Um, the other, the other um, uh, idea that we work around is thresholds. There are a lot of thresholds, both in the, uh, like the so psychosocial field that I work in, but also in the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, as soon as they, they meet the threshold, they um, uh, they give up. Uh, but if we follow people who have been through real bad hardships uh, on the, um, like, violence, psychological abuse uh, arena, and they need to be super active. I mean, the, the, the sickest people are all, always uh, the, the ones that needs to be most active in the healthcare system or the, in the support system around them because um, they need to do put in extra work for it, uh, because it's, it's not, never a, a straight path. So that's eliminating thresholds is a super important part for, for um, all of what we're doing. Uh, and the last thing uh, I called triggers, and that, that comes down to, you know, um, as we, we discussed in the beginning, if if I like prompt to everyone like, come and talk about your mental illness or come to seek help from me or come and have a conversation in a sauna. You know, we can get different results. Um, and if we have a conversation in a sauna, as we are now, um, we can get uh, really good results and everyone has their own experience, you know. It's it's not for for us. You don't need. You don't have to come when you need to come. You come and then you realize that this is a place for me. Uh, so then you can come back when you need to come. And that I think is the most important thing. That you know, uh, having a positive experience of seeking support. Uh, and and I'll get back to that in my closing. But uh, and that's really uh, like a, a key point that I want to make. Yeah. But I just wanted to uh, um, ask you one more question, Martin, because I was visiting the organization, but also just now starting to think that for men, 
maybe it's not only for Martin, but for all of you, the question is, for, for us, for men, what's the best place or kind of um, safe situation to talk between? Like, is it a real sauna? Or is it kind of organization so we can go and we know that this is a safe space uh, where there are kind of specialists? What can you share about your experience as well? So uh, we ask uh, our uh, audience that uh, a lot and uh, 90% of, no, no, not 90, 65% in like the age uh, 13 to, no, 10 to 15 say uh, a friend. But that's a double-edged sword, but that's what they're saying. Um, so having a friend is, is the most important. And that comes back to the, the discussion in the beginning and in the morning. Uh, I don't know if you were here, but it was about loneliness and comes back now. You know, it's having a friend to talk to. That's what 65% says. Uh, I think talking in a car, most of us have experience that looking forward and on the road not looking at your uh, fellow driver or passenger is a good way of talking uh, on an individual level I think that that works I've done that with my son uh, I've done that with uh, my my friends uh, and there are a lot of the things that's and easy to talk of, to talk about uh, looking into your uh, the eyes of the other uh, person, but that's more um, on an indiv individual level. I think uh, going back to what Martin said uh, later uh, earlier here, um, giving spaces for men that has low threshold. That's not uh, you. You shouldn't say come to us to talk about sexual issues or health or or or, or feelings. They won't come then. If if you ask them to come to to ask for uh, for uh, practical help with their health issues, take some tests maybe. If you're part of a screening, that's excellent because screening is something everybody do. But when you come to the doctor, the doctor should use uh, or to the ther therapist, uh, the therapist should use that room to 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 ask, is there an is there any qu other question you wanted to raise? Do you have any problem uh, in your on your private space? What about your uh, w w your marriage, your relation to the children? Uh, th then I think you have already made this uh, uh, this space uh, safe, and you can go on. And if you don't use that spaces, uh, if you don't get men in and use that space, you lose them. So. Um, Creating spaces uh, in, hel in the healthcare system that uh, looks like this is not just for women. Getting men in, talking about practical issues, issues uh, uh, helping them coping with uh, mental, uh, not mental health, but uh, uh, vaccine or what, what it should be. Uh, and then use that space to go on further. I think that would be uh, helpful for many men. Thanks. We've been thinking about this comfortability, and we haven't found a single solution. Someone, someone come to us and say that I, I, I need to do this by telephone. I can, I can call you when I'm going to the forest with my dog or when I'm driving my tractor. And then there are young guys, for example, who say that I, I'm most comfortable just writing to you. Let's have a chat. Uh, especially guys who say that they are not neurotypical. And then there are guys who say that when they come to our peer groups and they sit down and they have that coffee with others and they can discuss it there, that's, that's their safe space. That's their o oasis for the week. So it's their, their point of stability, the other guys there and their respect. And we have to provide all those services because otherwise we wouldn't get all those guys in. They have n different needs and they must be met. Yeah, I would uh, even add that these different needs are in all of society. That uh, There are a lot of uh, young women or just uh, uh, there are a lot of people who don't feel comfortable 
making a phone call or explaining something to their doctor, to their face. Uh, so the ability to actually tell what's going on in writing, or at least start a conversation in writing, will support a lot of people and so forth that different ways of entering for everyone will help other, uh, many people find their uh, approach. And to get these things started, of course, you need to sort of actually verbalize uh, or um, make these uh, challenges clear for yourself. And I do think that's where friends coming in. So having that rapport with people or with a friend with whom you're okay with sharing something and knowing that it's not gonna come back as a bad joke. It's not gonna come back as an attack on your manliness. Uh, that sort of, that trust actually takes quite a bit of build up. So when a friend shares having that respect to listen and not judge or not, not to make it into a joke because you don't know what else to do. So it's, up to men themselves to be that friend for others. Of course, society at large, because we all need that for everyone. And of course, then uh, these different ways of entry uh, that should be available. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Let me now uh, share uh, our results of our uh, kind of a small survey. So we had um, 23 men answered the question and 35 women. Uh, but um, I like the result in that way that 52% uh, were of men were asking help uh, when they were around mental health issues. And as for women, 80% of women were uh, seeking for help. And also I can see that uh, as, as we're talking about men, so 52% were already seeking for help. 26% not, and approximately 9% told that they don't need any help, and 4% told that I don't know uh, what's the right organization, what's the right way, or who is that friend uh, from whom to ask help. So, um, and thanks for you who are already asking our some questions. So I just wanted to uh, combine it with my next question which is about uh, collaboration and cooperation uh, on the level of state, so on the level of government, as uh, you are representing non-governmental organizations, NGOs uh, mostly. Uh, so how do you work? How do you collaborate with the state? Because now I recently, we had in Estonia several researchers about mental health. Um, and, uh, and now I see that uh, this work might be started just several months ago. We are just trying to uh, to collaborate with more organizations, NGOs, and some uh, psychotherapists, and so on. So, what's your view that uh, what's the best way to collaborate between government and NGOs and different kind of programs inside the country, internationally, as we do maybe today, also at least speaking. So the first depends on what sort of level of help we're looking at because there's a level of help where you're not really even seeking help or in the direct need of help this is sort of building a community and this is a, a really important part of uh, prevention so for that for that there are approaches that are also men specific but there's just general things that are for society at large so different sort of for students, we, for young people, we call them oh, basically, basically hobbies that bring uh, people together. Uh, in Estonia, there's this uh, uh, one NGO called uh, Men's Garage, which basically uh, creates a space for men to come together and tinker and meet each other and have a chat over that tinkering, building something. And that, that was one of those experiences where, yes, we have these general spaces for everyone, but Men sort of say, oh, that's not manly enough. That's not, that's not for us. So yeah, it had to be for men. Then they come. Of course, th we're st speaking of a subset of men in that sense. So, and such or, uh, organizations really should be partnering with the local municipality. The municipality is sort of 
giving an, uh, a shoulder for such organizations to build themselves up, to get themselves started, and if need be, keep them uh, going as well. But that's what I, I don't really see the government at uh, the highest level coming in, because this is local life, and uh, you can't really manage everything from that far at top. But on the state side, where I work, I mean, that's really, again, we're th then we're hitting the general population of, uh, and then we're looking at where, in what areas we do we need to specifically target men. Uh, I mean, su suicide prevention definitely is one of those. And uh, there, you can consider different programs and approaches, but again, I don't think we actually have those perfect ones or just something that's very well working for for the uh, for men, f just because of the men's their own reservations. Thank you. What experience do you have in Nordics, in Finland? Well, when we think about this, well, we've been creating programs for since 1995, and the first consideration is that where is the slot in our society for this? Because we can't do in associations, in non-governmental organizations, we can't do the same work and we shouldn't do the same work that governmental organizations are doing. So we have to find our niches there so that there's place for this. For example, when we began our work with depressed fathers with small ch children in their families, this was because they had no services for them. There was pre, pre and postnatal services for baby blues mothers or mothers who were having depression symptoms before giving birth. And these services were not taking the men in, and they are still not taking the men in in Finland. And because of this, there was a clear need for this kind of services. Because if someone in the family is depressed, it's easily something that others will experience too. The same goes for, for example, our new program where we meet men who are basically incel men in Finland. No one is meeting them, no one is helping them, no one wants them in their services. So if we are the only one that <laughs> is volunteering and seeking money for that, well, there's a need for that. And if, there, if we have distinct services that are helping the governmental organizations, then they will cooperate with that. But if, for example, we create a service that they are not certain is different from their services. I was there creating a help service for Finnish conscripts in, in the Finnish army. And the social service people in the army were not certain that we could be trusted or that the army wouldn't decrease their numbers because these services were going to be there. So they were hindering our services because of that. And the, the real problem there was that the areas of expertise and ex areas of work were not distinct enough. So that was part of the problem in cooperation there. So my only hint is that create services that are distinct and communicate those differences and how you are going to help the governmental organizations if you are in a non-governmental organization. If they get help, they want to cooperate. Thank you, Ernest. I think to, uh, to get governments to do uh, a bit work with um, men's mental health issues, I think uh, there is a combination of pressure and cooperation. Uh, we as NGOs organi organized in civil society uh, holds a, a great deal of experiences in Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland as well. Uh, and that's, it's crucial that governments actually use that experience to develop their services. And to do that, I think, it's a very important topic uh, raising what is gender equality. And still gender equality is understood as women's gender equality issues only. But gender equality is very, it, uh, or as I would say, like stealing in Norwegian, jämställdhet in Swedish, uh, equality in English, that's a main part of the welfare state. And our societies are depending on the welfare state. And the welfare state, uh, one of the main things for a, a functioning welfare state that, that 
is all that are living in a welfare state understand that equality is for me. Equality isn't just for women. Yes, there's still much to do to uh, to, to better uh, women's uh, gender equality situation. But there's at the same time a lot of issues and problems for men that we haven't seen. So to understand this, to, 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 under, to, to change the notion about what is equality, what is gender equality, it's also about men. And I had to add, it's for everyone. Uh, seeking problem because of they are in a marginalized situation. Minorities, LGBT people, queer people, they are in the greatest need of help because they are often the most lonely, uh, the most prone to suicide. The same with disabled people, ethnic minorities, national minor minorities. We have to take all these groups into the consideration of what is equality. And if we do that, we will understand that gender equality for men is a part of a bigger understanding of the picture of what is a welfare state. I think this is very important. I have been a, a part of a Norwegian uh, commission put down by the government called the Men's Gender Equality Commission that uh, uh, delivered its report in April this year. And we have pointed out 35 areas that has to be d done something with. Uh, that's a program for our government to, to act on. I hope they will do that. I'm not sure, but we will pressure them to do that. And one of those uh, uh, issues is to put down a um, men's health commission in Norway as we have done in Finland, as we have done in Sweden, Norway hasn't done that. We don't know actually what is the situation for men, also when it comes to mental health. So pressuring uh, uh, the governments uh, from our civil society position, I think is very important to actually better the welfare state in the Nordics and in the Baltics. Thanks, Ari. Um. I really don't have anything to add to this. Uh, I think also, um, you know, pushing pushing the policymakers is is the, you know the key component for me. Uh, we we often uh, find ourselves in a service provider or uh, role. Um, we find find ourselves in a cooperative uh, cooperation role, not not getting any money for our uh, time and our knowledge. Um, so, um, and I, I, I think we will be silenced if, if, if we um, become too much of a service provider. Um, but I want to say something about the, um, the um, pseudo um, uh, thing. I, we did a, um, a report um, on um, young people being sexually abused, sexually uh, uh, abused of sexual violence uh, when they were um, between 15 and 18, and then uh, seeking support and help uh, later in life. Um, we wanted to know how that journey uh, looked. Uh, we, ha we got 360 answers, and 60 of them said, I don't need any help. And, and for me, that was really puzzling, and um, I haven't really got my head around it yet. So. If you've been, um, and that w uh, it was, everyone could uh, take part of it, but you had to have like a, um, uh, be abused of a rape, for instance. So it was um, men, women, uh, non-binary people. Um, but 60 people said that they don't, they don't need help after uh, being um, uh, violated, like violated like that. I, I can't get my head around that, and and. And that, and if you only had like a, I only have depression. I don't need any help. That's, I mean, how that to <coughs> overcome that hurdle is really that's a tough one. So, not not speaking on policy making, but um, was yeah. That only men? No, that was uh, women, men, and non-binary non people. So. Thank you, dear man, for that. Uh, we have approximately 25 minutes until the end of our discussion, so I suppose that now it's the time to ask from you, dear audience, do you have any questions to our panelists? 
around the topic of uh, men's mental health. The one hand is there. And I also see some of your questions coming via this uh, slider, so I also uh, will read them a little bit later. Thank you. My question is, what do you think, what do we have to do in education? What do we have to study in schools or kindergartens to talk more about this theme? Do we have to do something with parents to explain them something? Or s maybe you know some books or uh, videos that we, everyone, have to watch? So my uh, previous background actually is in education and uh, Working in both education and in the mental health sector, I will say knowledge is not the primary issue. Just knowing that something you should do something will not change the, all of your conditioning. So there's a lot more that we need to do in how we build social narratives. And that is a lot, of, a lot to do with how we, on, in the NGO sector especially, ourselves organize to get these ideas more out there and normalize them because the more we talk the more we normalize but then uh, what could it be like some the kind of practical things at schools or not only at schools the most practical things that schools can do is bri uh, get more male teachers and same goes double for kindergartens Absolutely. in in th the thing about knowledge is that there are messages that are being given that are not about education per se. In Finland, we had a situation where we uh, had a s study where they they watched people interacting in kindergartens, and they counted the words that were being said, and they found out that there were a thousand words less being said throughout the day to boys. They were just left out to fend for themselves. And that's a, that's a pretty strong message to send to three-year-olds. We have to take the boys in. We have to give them the same care, the same knowledge too. But even the sense of worth and skills of friendship that they will need in workplaces, in relationships with their spouses, friends, kids, that that's something that is just going to pay off in the future. But that starts really early. And the attitudes of the people meeting those children are crucial. I think uh, what you can do working in the school uh, is, as Jonas said, uh, um, thinking about how are, how is the situation for boys and maybe also have the same expectation to boys as you have to girls. Uh, we tend to lower the expectation for, for, for boys. And if we do, we don't uh, give them the same opportunity to challenge their um, behavior, challenge their needs. And we know more and more boys fall out, out of school. That's the situation in, Aus in, no in Norway. I think it's a situation in all the Nordics and the Baltics too. And then uh, bol boys fall uh, behind girls. And that's not just in kindergarten in school. It's, it's for the rest of their lives. They don't get uh, partners, they don't get children, uh, many of them. Uh, so it's important to see boys as uh, someone we have to uh, expect the same things from as we do from girls. I think that's important. One really concrete uh, thing um, uh, that uh, we do, uh, we, we uh, made a um, school, uh, school, we have several school programs, but especially one called the, the Macho Factory, uh, which um, teaches, um, not teaches, but uh, brings up the subject of uh, norms, masculinity norms, uh, especially. And I think it's translated, so it's on our uh, or our English uh, web page is like 20 short movies or something like that. So it's a kind of useful program to um, just uh, have, as, have, as, have as a conversation starter with your kids in school. Yes. I'll, I'll just add one thing. It's, it's really important to give them the basic skills and norms of the society. I'll, I'll tell about the failure. 
<laughs> in the 1990s in Finland, we were in a deep depression, uh, economic depression, not just in our minds. And part of that was that we didn't have any resources in our school system. So we stopped sexual education for a few years. And that was, we had excellent sexual education in the 1980s. And then again, in the later part of 90s, we brought it up. But we still see those generations from there. They are having more sexually transmitted diseases still. They had more abortions. They raped and got raped more. And this is just, this is the only variable that changed there. Okay, there was the economic depression, but the other generations that still got that education didn't fail as spectacularly as that generation did. So schools are crucial in these regards too. Uh, they don't have enough time for everything that they would need to do, but do not let them fail. Teachers, is, teachers are the most important uh, profession in the world. And male teachers especially. No, I would say <laughs> both sexes, all sexes. We can't say that um, uh, female teachers are uh, more uh, not that good as, as as female. We need more men to work in uh, the, 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 the fields that women are uh, in the ma majority now. It's also in the healthcare sec sector and in the kindergartens and in the education system. But... Uh, Still, this the people working there are th that's uh, th the value we have today. We have to 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 to, to use that and also get ma more men in. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We don't need more male teachers because they're better. We need more male teachers because boys also need to be able to relate to their teachers. And also, of course, there are m more shared experience things as things that you are better able to understand. Plus, having served in the Estonian Defense Forces and having seen how ugly uh, a system where it's 100% men can get, I would say that every extreme in this is bad. And uh, another side of that is also when I was a male teacher, I entered a room of beginner teachers and their mentors. There was, uh, there was around 50 people all together. I was the only man in the room, and I checked twice to make sure that I'm in the right spot, that they didn't actually do like a men's and female separate. And it was really uncomfortable to be the only man in that room. So we're, that another part of this is also that we're excluding a huge part of the potential teacher pool. Uh, and of course, in every other sector as well, if there's a lot of women in one sector, that means that there's gonna be a misbalance in somewhere else as well. So we also have these uh, misbalances or uh, inequalities in other sectors, which is also unhealthy. I suppose this is the a place where we can uh, study from Nordics as well, because I remember my first visit to Copenhagen, which was, I don't know, maybe more than 10 years ago, and I was passing through some kindergarten. And then I, I saw a, a teacher, male, male teacher in the kindergarten. For me, it was a bit of cultural shock, because in when I was a kid, only I, I saw only women teachers and all the stuff in kindergarten and then the paternity leaves and all that stuff so so that makes uh, male men also equal in these fields where we can see more women now so do we have any more yes we have one more question thank you very much uh, first of all say thanks for organizing this debate i think this uh, discussion merits much more attention than it is getting um, since uh, I have the microphone, I'll ask two questions, if you permit me. Uh, I work in the Estonian Ministry of Defense, and the Defense Forces have gone through this debate a few times. So I'd like to ask you on this panel, in your experience, um, how much could the armed forces be used and leveraged to mitigate the problems that we've discussed, especially considering that all the Nordic countries, in a form or another, have a reserve army-based system? And then the second question I have is regarding different campaigns that have been organized to bring attention to this issue. Uh, in November, we have the Movember campaign, which uh, gets some light. We have the Big Game Supros in Estonia. Um, but those campaigns, to my 
in my view at least, don't get too much attention, at least in Estonia. So my question is, uh, are there any good cases where these campaigns have actually had a lasting impact on propagating these issues? Thanks. Uh, just jumping in on that, the Defense Forces side, as someone who's served as well, which was of course quite a long time ago, and I know there's been a lot of change since then, and I've heard, I've heard very good things on that side, so good job. Uh, and thinking back on my personal experience there, yes, there's a lot that could be done, because again, the Army, when you're training to be a soldier, it is also sort of a standardization process. You are being trained to fill a role a preset role, so, and you also need to pick up that culture of the institution. So there are choices to be made on what sort of culture that is, and especially if we think, think of the reserve uh, aspect of that, where you will be for years uh, longer as well. And the army has an expectation that you will be able, capable of uh, defending the country when the need comes, so this means you're in the necessary physical shape and mental state to serve. So if we manage to just build those necessary uh, sort of standards and expectations during service and also build up that expectation that you need to maintain this, we're going to keep an eye on this. Like when you come to these reserve trainings, we're going to check up on you and make sure you're keeping active. How's your mental health? If there are issues, we'll sort of tell you to get, go, go and see your doctor, for instance. There are opportunities there. It just needs to be planned in. Of course, changing cultures is always very difficult. I will pick up on that. I think uh, it's a very good question. Uh, the Armed Forces is an extremely male-dominated organization uh, historically. But I guess you have uh, also female uh, soldiers in, uh, in Estonia now, yes? 1%, okay, but uh, that should be uh, high end. We should have more, but uh, what is important, It we haven't talked about a very important issue that's called uh, um, uh, work-life balance. Uh, so th uh, to be able to, to, to live your life as a father d uh, when you are in the armed forces, it's very important. Uh, giving uh, permission, leave, uh, paternal leave to men, uh, even if they are overseas, so that they can keep up their contact with their families. I think that's very important. We have that uh, discussion in Norway, how to do that. Uh, it's not always easy, but you have the some same problem in other areas, and it has been solved. It's important that also uh, sectors like uh, the armed forces uh, are looking into this to make uh, this kind of um, male area more attractive to, to women and also for men uh, being caregivers. Because I think caregiving, we haven't talked about that either, but a, a lot, but caregiving and uh, men as caregivers have, uh, 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 have exploded the, the last decades in the Nordics. And it has been very important for uh, changing what a man can be. Yes, a man can take care of children. A man has to learn it, but that goes for women too. So um, also bringing that into the armed forces, I think that would be a nice challenge f for you to go further on with. Um, uh, this is a uh, is interesting topic, and I think um, uh, the um, armed forces has a has a great potential to to um, work with mental illness uh, for, for two, two reasons. Um, w one is that I'm guessing that um, the Estonian Armed Forces, as many other armed forces, has like a routine for debriefing after going on a tour. Um, so there, there are a safety regulation um, already in, in place. Um, I don't know how well it's working. Uh, I know that I, I worked with that part of the Swedish Armed Forces um, 15 years ago, and they were at a, like a tipping point. Um, the, the people had, who had been out in, um, in Yugoslavia and uh, a, a few of the early tours in, in um, Chad, I think, 
uh, really came back in a uh, uh, miserable state, uh, but then they, they got things going and, and the, the, the debriefing and, and the, um, the support afterwards really uh, were functioning well, I think. Um, but the other, the other uh, thing that I think um, the armed forces has a, has a potential in is that you have like a good or a uh, perfect structure for you know safety regulations. You know, uh, if if you're on a um, main battle tank, you know every safety regulations there is on it, and you have a f you follow a strict procedure every time you onboard and disembark. So. Um, those kinds of regulations are applicable to mental health as well. They're they're applicable to your personal gear. They're applicable to uh, you know um, how you arrange a platoon. So I think that there is a there is a, um, like a, a, a as soon as as the the general sees as, uh, sees it as a um, prioritized area. I think it's workable. But yeah, I don't I don't have any. <laughs> practical tips. Well, in the, 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 the participants in United Nations missions and so on, they are a different situation, but at least with conscripts, the ar armed forces should be prepared to meet the situations that regularly happen. The main crisis that the people have there. For example, the conscripts will have relationships outside that their time there and those will break up. It's a ridiculous amount of heartbreak that the conscripts have. And that must be prepared for. Some of them will get weary, they will be tired, they need, will need support and they may need services during that time. And that's just something that you have to be prepared for. And the same goes for in Finland, they are young guys and girls who are in the army. So they are preparing for their studies. And if this is something that is supported, that gives a clear message that there's, a, there's life outside this too. And then there's help that is needed if they have young children. And those situations must be met. These are clearly situations that are the most prevalent ones. And then there are attitudes that are distinct in the armies and must be noticed and met. For example, attitudes towards women, especially if there are women conscripts, they need to be treated respectfully. The attitudes toward gays can be harsh. This is something that at least the Finnish army has been working on and it is getting better. In Finland, maybe the attitudes towards gay men has been getting better all the time, but especially attitudes towards trans women are something that are really not there yet. But in the armies, the attitudes towards transgendered people is something that must be discussed, and it's something that the culture there should not not should not be creating humor out of or creating their identity as something else than trans people because that's not all that men can be. They shouldn't be defined by being not being something but by being themselves because that's something that can be so much more. But that, that is, I, I, I'd stick to the practical things, the problems that arise there and the attitudes that may need adjusting. Thank you. We have still uh, some questions, but we have no time. We have only six minutes left. And I would like also to ask one more question from the audience and uh, from those who are watching us uh, online. So uh, while you are answering, it's quite a practical. We will wrap up our panel discussion here with the same question. So what steps can every man do to maintain his uh, mental, physical, sexual, doesn't matter, his health? So maybe just a kind of advice from each of you, from the, your perspective, from the experience of your organization. Really quick, quickly, um, homework. Uh, try to 
seek support, not, not necessarily help, but support um, in uh, the coming week. Um, seeking support is uh, something that we need to train uh, on. It's not easy the first times and it can be uh, both scary and it can also backfire, but you need to keep trying. So uh, try to seek support and also listen to a friend and don't help them, don't come with solutions, just listen, be a um, friend to them. Um, that's my top two <laughs> tips. Just, just a second, Eric. I would like you to also to uh, answer the question uh, using the same slide and the same code. And the question is, I didn't tell it. Uh, so what resources, campaigns, organizations do you know uh, which can help and provide support to men with their mental health issues? So we'll also wrap up with your uh, advices. Yes, and we can, we can continue with your top. Yeah. I agree with uh, Martin. I think it's very important that you in the next week, why not? Talk to a friend, ask him, how, are you, how do you do? And he, he answers, I'm okay, how are you? And then you say, are you really okay? And dip, uh, dig deeper, try to do that with a friend you suppose not have uh, told you the whole truth. And uh, for yourself, uh, be open uh, to the one near you. Tell about uh, your uh, anxiety or your fear and check out the result. I think by doing that, you will uh, understand, I hope, that uh, that is not too dangerous to do. And should you meet uh, a reaction that's not uh, good for you, uh, discuss that with that, uh, that person. Why are you avoiding my question? Try to get a dialogue with your nearest ones, if you have one. About yourself, if you have any issues. Okay, I, I may have a twofold answer. In our experience, at least in Finland, men, when they are beginning to talk about their problems, they really have thought that through. They, they have been experiencing the situation for far too long. For example, cancer. That's a prime example, because men are dying from cancers that could be treated. And mental health problems too. They have been experiencing those, and they are really serious when they bring those up. So if, you, if a man comes to you and begins to talk about his problems, listen, and don't try to diminish the situation, because it's possible that he is already doing that and trying to downplay it so that he wouldn't scare you. Listen and encourage him to seek whatever help or whatever he needs. And men, don't wait that long. You are worthy of help. Your problems, when, they wo when you are worried about them, you really should be seeking out what is going on. So. Listen, and men, go on and get that help. So, probably the most, well, okay, I'll try to give two practical points, and one is very straightforward. Uh, the Estonians here know Beasi, probably. Uh, so, beasi.ee, uh, so this uh, website in Estonia where a lot of uh, mental health information is available, and uh, the mental health vitamins so, which is basically five things you should do for your mental health. Get, to get enough sleep, uh, ha uh, spend time with uh, people, so get connection to, uh, to others. Do things that uh, make you feel good. Uh, eat well and definitely sleep well. Like sleep is one of the, if, if you don't have sleep covered, it's hard to get anything else uh, in line. And I do want to touch on these uh, talking to a friend or someone part as well. I, one of the this is to approach someone or talk to a friend when you or they need help. Another thing is work on your relationships even when you don't need either. Either of you don't need any. Uh, m us men tend to sort of not give the special attention to keeping our friendships. So whenever we get older, we sort of lose those connections. Especially very common, it's that 
when we uh, get married or start a family, our social lives get mar uh, managed by our partner. And basically, we lose our own friends and our friends are our partner's friends. And when, uh, when uh, we en end up splitting up, then our partner leaves with our, all of our social network. Keep your friends. Work on that deliberately. Even when you don't need anything, they don't need anything, just spend time together. Make that a goal. Excellent. <laughs> and also, uh, before wrapping up, uh, thanks for your advices. Uh, Ot, you were mentioning this uh, PRC.de, which is mentioned here also in your answers uh, several times. And also uh, creating and supporting different communities and places where people can meet. So friends, we need some space to meet with friends. But sauna is also one of these possibilities. And uh, yeah, we have this Movember, for example, and uh, also yeah, some NGOs which you can find, I hope, that in every country. Yeah, and actually on building those networks, uh, don't just have a job, have a hobby, or volunteer somewhere. Have other networks, not just a job. And I suppose that with these good advices, we can really uh, finalize our today's discussion. Thank you very much for coming to Estonia, for being with us, and thanks to your audience uh, and those who are watching uh, us online. And let's continue to, uh, to create this more inclusive and supportive uh, environment, not only for men, but for women, for everybody's mental health. Sa thank you for being with us, and I suppose we'll also publish all your advices on our Facebook page so we can share all what we have. Thanks a lot, and uh, now you have approximately half an hour to network with each other, to find a new friend, and not only men, but all who are here. Thanks a lot.